This is a photograph of the day Lincoln became president, March 4th, 1861, in front of the incomplete Capitol. And you can see a lot of people there. You can't see Lincoln, but he's, he's there. And um, this is where most books about Lincoln as president dig in. Here's his first day on the job. For me, this was the end. I wanted to get to this point and show how incredibly difficult it was for Lincoln to even make it to what we think of as the normal beginning of his presidency. It was a, a Herculean challenge to get through this violent, angry country and even make it to those steps. So I, I was looking at it from the opposite point of view. Uh, here's a, a, the B manuscript copy of his first inaugural address. And you can see he was writing things pretty close to the day of the speech. And the famous quote about the better angels of our nature is, is written in, in in pen at the bottom. So you see a speech coming together still uh, pretty haphazardly. He's been given some suggestions from William Seward, his Secretary of State. But things were really up in the air, and I wanted to capture that feeling in, in the book. So here's a picture of the Capitol about a year earlier. You see this um, toxic canal, the city canal that flowed in front of it, pretty near the site of the, the assault on the Capitol on January 6th as they came up the mall. This would be in the middle of the mall now. And as I wrote the story, it, you know, it, it dawned on me more slowly. I didn't quite know what I was doing until I got more deeply into it. But um, in a way, the villain, if Lincoln is the hero, and he is, the villain was this toxic city of pestilence and lobbying and protection of slavery that had been here, been the capital since 1800, and had blocked progressive reform ever since that time. And so Lincoln has to get into a structure of government that is a kind of fortress against him. And that added to the difficulty of, of the trip. So here he is on the, or just after he was nominated, two days after his nomination, surprise nomination in Chicago, um, looking really incredibly young. We have I think in our minds, different ideas about how old Abraham Lincoln actually was. He looks quite old at the end of his life, but uh, uh, in this year, he was 51 years old, really quite young. What's that, 26, 27 years younger than, than President Biden? And I like this particular image, which is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, because it shows how photographs were were rare enough that they, they were looked at it almost as if they were paintings with frames around them. So one of the heroes of my book is a woman, and I'm so happy to have a, a, a woman in a Civil War story because there are so few of them. Dorothea Dix was a mental health advocate from, she was actually born in Maine, but she grew up in Massachusetts. And she did so much good work all around the country that she was very well regarded in the South as well as the North. And in a trip through the South in the fall of 1860, she picks up hard intelligence that uh, Lincoln is going to be killed on his way into Washington. She knows exactly where it will happen. So this is a map of the main train line from Philadelphia to um, Wil through Wilmington, Baltimore, and then ultimately to Washington. And you can see a big chunk of the Eastern Shore on this map, and she had identified the spots. They were, there were would-be assassins walking underneath train bridges. There are a lot of, as you know, anyone who lives in Maryland, there are a lot of duck blinds and little creeks and the railroad, especially between um, Haver to Grace and Baltimore, goes over a lot of little creeks, like Gunpowder Creek. I bet a lot of you know them better, better than I do. But over small bridges that could easily be um, dynamited or people could be standing there with, with guns if the train could be stopped. And um, she went to the head of this railroad. It's a man named Samuel Felton whose offices were in Philadelphia. And she told him all about the plot. And he 
took action. And I believe that the confluence of Dorothea Dix and this alert CEO of a railroad saved Lincoln's life in 1861. So the man on the left is Alan Pinkerton. That's Lincoln in the middle, of course. Um, Alan Pinkerton with the Napoleon pose of the hand in the jacket um, was hired by the head of that railroad. He was a railroad detective based in Chicago. He was an immigrant from Scotland. Immigrants are important always in the story of Lincoln. He, he liked them and, and vice versa. Um, and Pinkerton is hired immediately after the Dorothea Dix meeting to come east and infiltrate the assassins. And that meant going into Baltimore, into restaurants, oyster bars, taverns, and impersonating Lincoln-hating Southerners or, or Marylanders. Let's, let's be honest, Marylanders were, were pretty Southern in 1861. And he did a brilliant job. And he got all the information that they needed to, to protect Lincoln. One of his agents he brought with him, and there really should be a movie about her, Actually, there was a story in the Washington Post two days ago about her. I still don't know if it's Warren or Warnie, but this brilliant woman, Kate Warney, was a young widow in Chicago who went to Alan Pinkerton and said, I think women can be detectives as well as men, and maybe even more so. And he didn't want to hire her at first, and she was very persistent, and she became one of his star agents. And she was brilliant at impersonating Southerners, and she came to Baltimore and she was so good at her job that Pinkerton sent her to warn Lincoln as he's coming in on the train. He sent Kate Warney to tell him that you, you cannot come through Baltimore in the middle of the day or you will be killed. So she's an unsung hero of American history. So the trip begins on February 11th, a week ago today, in 1861. Lincoln gives this beautiful farewell speech to his hometown of Springfield, and, you know, kind of like how I feel about Chestertown. He was saying, I have lived among you. you. You know me, and I know you. And we are here to help each other. And he gave this just extraordinary speech about what he was about to do, going on a difficult trip to save the American experiment, and how hard it would be and how it was harder than any, chore, any challenge any president had faced since George Washington. Um, in saying goodbye, he mentioned a few very personal facts about his life in Springfield, including the fact that uh, one of his children was buried in, in Springfield. And people began to cry as he spoke, and he began to cry, which he didn't do very often. And there were no notes, but there were reporters there, and they transcribed the short speech and wrote it down, and it was the beginning of a kind of miracle that began to happen and never stopped happening, which is this obscure Illinois politician who no one knew very much about, turned out to be the greatest giver of speeches in, in American history, and, and I, I feel safe to say of all time because I don't think anyone will ever top him, but he was able to reach into his emotional register as well as just talk about the issues in a very clear way. And that short speech of farewell was transcribed by the reporters and sent all around the country by telegraph. And it did a great deal of good for someone who had the world, the weight of the world on his shoulders. And just by talking about how much he loved his town, he related to America. And that really helped him when he was, he, he hadn't even won 40% of the vote. He began to climb up in the estimation of America from that moment on.